So, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to see so many of you here, and uh, I am joined uh, now by the uh, Executive Director of the European Biogas Association, Harman Decker, and Chris Hune, who's ADBA's new chairman. So, I'm, gonna, I'm Charlotte Morton from the World Biogas Association. Welcome to uh, our summit today. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to hand over to you to give your uh, uh, presentation uh, to our audience. Thank you very much. And um, I'm really glad to be with you, although it's uh, only on screen uh, today, um, because I believe we have, um, we have a huge challenge. The world changed fundamentally on the 24th of February. Um, and I don't think we've ever faced uh, such a cluster of challenges uh, very often before. Um, Putin, with his unprovoked uh, war against Ukraine, has given us an extra challenge, as though we needed an extra challenge. But the consequence of that is that our energy markets are out of balance. The prices of oil, coal and gas have exploded. And um, there's a lot of worry around the world uh, uh, about um, global food supplies. Um, our Ukrainian friends are fighting for their freedom, fighting to defend our values, the values we share with them. And uh, I think it is imperative that we as Europeans um, support the Ukrainians uh, however we can, uh, because uh, they're not just fighting for their own freedom, they're also fighting to uphold our values. And Putin is trying to prove that autocracy trumps democracy, and we have to make sure that uh, we prove him wrong. Um, but anyway, any in, the, in these uncertain times, one thing's for sure, um, we need to speed up our transition uh, to uh, clean energy. Uh, the need for that has, not ever, has, has never been stronger than today. And whatever people are saying, um, some people not believing in, in all of this, I think if you look across the European Union, you talk to people, you see what's happening. Um, Europeans do understand that the benefits of clean energy uh, are greater today than ever before, and they want to be part of that. We've never seen such a high demand for heat pumps, for insulating homes, for installing rooftop solar panels, for electric cars, and for saving energy. Um, I think that what we're experiencing today uh, will determine uh, the choices we will have to make tomorrow and then in the near future. Um, you know, I, I remember I was I was still still a teenager, but in the oil crisis of the 1970s, we learned to live with that and we learned to adapt and change our behaviour. Uh, we learned the value of saving energy, um, and I think that generations living today. Um, we'll have we'll have experienced uh, firsthand that the best energy is uh, the energy that is not controlled by somebody else and that cannot be used against you. Um, so that means in the European context, since since we don't have our own oil and very little gas or very little coal left, that the best energy to increase our resilience and our sovereignty is renewable energy. Um, so faced with the crisis we see today, we essentially have two two options. We can either subsidize fossil gas consumption uh, and try to recreate the world we left behind, uh, uh, where gas prices were at a historic low. People, people often say we were so naive about Russia. I think we were not that, that naive, we were rather, rather greedy. We just wanted to have the cheap gas because it kept us going so well. So we could choose to go back to that world and I think that would not be a smart choice. I think it's much smarter to spend the money that we have on making our economy more resilient and a lot less dependent on uh, volatile fossil fuels. You know, if, if, if the climate crisis didn't convince you, at least the geopolitical situation should uh, convince you. Now, with the European Union, I think we've made a, a clear choice. We want to phase out as quickly as we can our dependence on Russian fossil fuels, and we want to double down on clean energy transition and also we want to um, make a, a, a stronger effort on energy savings. Uh, we call this strategy Repower EU because the investments we're going to support will make our union stronger and repower the European economy. Yes, we will have to sign new gas deals with suppliers who don't use gas as a weapon. And we'll have to build new gas infrastructure, albeit in a limited uh, way, to replace the imports of Russian gas 
but I hope we can do this in a smart way. And we have the plans to do this in an intelligent way, in a future-oriented way. We will do it as a union, and we will prepare for the switch to... He was just about to say... Oh, he was just about to say, we're going to prepare the world for a switch to biomethane. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well. is, he, is he coming back? back? Okay. Okay, so he hasn't yet really covered by me thing. So while we wait for him to come back, can I ask you, Harman, just to give a brief set the scene for what the European Commission has committed to as far as by me thing is concerned? Oh, he's back. Right, okay. Right. okay. Well, so I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know what's happening. There's something wrong with the connection. Don't You're now back, uh, France, and you were just about to talk about the transition to biomethane, weren't you? <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't see when I was cut off. I was just speaking to you. Um, ah, so so um, we, we want to achieve a target at 35 uh, BCM of biomethane to replace a quarter of Russian gas imports every year by 2030. So to achieve that target, uh, which is going to be a significant step up from the three BCM we have today, we need to do many things. Um, so we need an action plan. Uh, I would like to mention here five actions we're planning to take. First, we will establish a biogas and biomethane industrial partnership to help you prepare a project pipeline, which is ambitious enough to achieve the targets we set for 2030 and 2050. Very soon, we will propose the structure of this partnership and I would like to encourage you all to take part in setting it up. Second, we will work with member states to prepare and implement national strategies on biogas and biomethane production so that we can better evaluate the potential across the member states to identify and to plan the most appropriate actions and to streamline best practices to speed up production. Third, we will promote cooperation with neighboring and accession countries to integrate them better in our gas market. Let me stress on this occasion that I see a huge potential for biomethane development in Ukraine as part of the reconstruction effort, and that the EU will support these developments in the months to come. Fourth, we will work with the national authorities and gas network companies to reduce the cost and to speed up permitting of projects. That is something that I'm, you know, we get so many requests from across the European Union to help them speed up the permitting. And last but not least, we will promote new infrastructure and help address gaps in research, development, innovation, and demonstration. Now, all these actions are important, but truth be told, they will still bring limited results if we ignore the financial aspects and if we don't have the right regulations in place. To get investments going, we will maximize the use of common agricultural policy, the recovery and resilience facility, and cohesion policy funds for biomethane investments. But these are other policy, there are also other po possibilities like Horizon Europe, the Innovation Fund, and the Modernization Fund. And we really want to work with the European Investment Bank to further increase the targeted support for pre commercial plants under InvestEU. Uh, we will also make sure that we have the right regulatory framework in place. This is important because we want to promote only sustainable, mainly waste based biogas and biomethane to avoid any conflict with food and, fee and feed value chains. Uh, the main objective to generate more sustainable and domestic gas on our market ca cannot infringe other priorities of the EU, including sustainability of food uh, security. So this is where we want to start. Um, the Renewable Energy Directive is clearly supportive of sustainable waste and residue-based biogas and biomethane production. Hydrogen uh, and, the, and gas decarbonization package, which we proposed last winter, further supports the deployment of sustainable and low carbon gases. Um, so it's a starting point. Uh, you know, this is the direction of travel we want to indicate. And we were to, want to work very closely with you to make this a successful effort. We're, we, we've got some really pretty challenging times ahead. But if we move uh, along these, these lines, I think we can really achieve a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Franz. I think it's fantastic to hear such uh, clear commitment uh, to, to biomethane. I think the point you make about uh, speed uh, and the need to put in place uh, the support mechanisms as fast as possible is absolutely critical. Um, and I know from speaking to various of our members that um, the different regimes in different countries does present quite a hurdle. So standardizing as much as possible will be absolutely critical. Um, so, um, 
uh, we, we have here, as I say, um, Harman Decker from the European Biogas Association. I'm from the World Biogas Association. We have the, the, the chair of the ADBA here, uh, all committed to work with you. Um, what help would you find most valuable uh, from all of us in particular? Well, I think the most important thing for us is that, that when we make these projects, um, we're able to... So, we unfortunately feel that we have lost him, um, but um, he... That was... A, hmm? That was... That was final. Oh, that was final. <laughs> <He's not out. laughs> so, um, but, I mean, I think that was a very uh, clear outline of points um, that they want to put in, that the Commission wants to put in place. So, um, Harman, how do you... How did you feel about that? Did that was that new, any of that, uh, from your perspective? Uh, well, not so much new. I think, of course, uh, on the 8th of March, we had the first Repower EU communication, the 18th of May, the action plan, uh, biomethane action plan in there. Um, so it was building up already to this. And uh, I, I think he has not done much wrong, actually. He is really supportive of biogas and biomethane. He is setting the framework for other member states to, to work on. We have to realize also the difficulty of the European Commission that member states have a right and a big say, so he cannot set everything in stone. So he needs to work uh, with it. And I think probably the, one of the best things coming out of here is uh, the industrial partnership, the biomethane industrial partnership. We call it BIP by this time. Um, that is a very good first step. Uh, we've been working actually with the cabinet of Timmermans uh, months before, since October already, to set first a target and then to uh, talk about this BIP. Um, now we're going to, to work out the, the governance structure together with the European Commission. And it is important for, as soon as it is realized, that we all join that and, and really empower this. Absolutely. Chris, what would be your um, Well, I, I, I come at this as a slightly... Um, jaded and cynical former <laughs> member of the European Parliament. Because I was a member of the European Parliament um, over a long six, six years and went through a number of legislative cycles. And it's worth just reminding people of the, co the way the Constitution works in the European Union. Franz Timmermans is the commissioner. So if the commission makes a proposal, it has the power to make proposals but it doesn't have the power to actually uh, make law. That will require the agreement of the member states. And mostly in this sort of area, it's member state support schemes which are really crucial. So the real issue now, I think what he's saying is fantastic. I think what, and, and the level of commitment, I believe actually, I really do think that there is a new level of commitment for exactly the reasons that he gave. You know, that not only did we see an enormous increase, by the way, in the natural gas price before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the 23rd of February. I, I actually just looked it up uh, this morning. But if you take it in euros per megawatt hour, the, the gas price went uh, from one year ago, it was 28 euros per megawatt hour. On the eve of the Russian invasion, it had already risen to 79.79 euros per megawatt hour. So it was already an increase of 184%. And the rise since then is another 27%. But it's a much smaller percentage rise than actually the rise before. Now, I know Vladimir Putin was playing games beforehand. He wasn't filling up the... European storage, Gazprom, which owned a lot of European gas storage, wasn't filling up. So, yes, there was some sense in which there were games being played ahead of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But this is a world gas crisis. The U.S. gas, cri gas price has also has doubled over this period. You're getting a massive installation of U.S. LNG export terminals, liquefaction terminals. So I think the game really has changed. So I believe what he's saying. And I also think there will be enough member states, particularly, I think, some of the ones that are really in the front line, uh, like Poland, for example, who will really want to move quickly on this. And 
uh, you know, there will be others who won't be so keen and won't, won't move quite so quickly and who will plead budget constraints and so forth. So we'll have to see. So the key thing will be, um, in my judgment, is this another commission wishful thinking plan? And, for example, if you were to put all the commission plans for tax harmonization uh, on a table, they would be up to here, and they've never got anywhere because member states have never agreed them. And by the way, that includes after the British left. Uh, so, <laughs> so, you know, just to be, just to be clear. Um, but on this, I think there is real political buy-in and a real political understanding from parts of the political spectrum that up until now have been, yeah, maybe half enthusiastic about biogas as a way of tackling climate change but now can see very clearly that biogas is a way of dealing with Europe's excessive dependence on Russian gas imports. And that's a, that brings a whole new uh, group of people into the coalition in favor of biomethane. And I think, that, I think that's real. But there's just one cautionary note. Commission setting a target, commission saying we want to do this, and then actually seeing the color of the money which is what investors need. They need certainty about the time frame so that you're getting a, when you do your discounted cash flow analysis, it's actually coming out ahead of your costs of capital. We haven't got there yet. But I think we will, at least in quite a lot of member states. Well, I think, and I think that's really interesting that um, the, 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 the point that you made about the need for countries to come together and, and, and agree, which has been quite difficult. Um, do you think, Harman, that um, the extent of the crises that we are facing and the very clear c political will there could actually mean that for once we do start to get uh, alignment? And, and, and what would be the key things you would want to get alignment on across countries? Right. Um, let's first say that I am not as cynical but also realistic that it is very hard to get all the members and the member states aligned. Um, I see, though, that this has been this has been approved by the council, um, and we have been working with them, and we know what the reservations are. He mentioned um, clearly there must not be um, a intervention with regard to food and feed, because we have a food crisis coming up as well. So he was clearly mentioning biomethane needs to be sustainable. That is coming from the council. It was a clear message. We need to be sustainable also in biomethane, but we can. And actually, when we um, build the, 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 say the, the, how we are going to make the 35 billion, and actually a billion cubic meters and beyond, um, the member states were convinced. And I was speaking um, um, in, in Spain a while ago. I was speaking to Poland as well, Czech Republic, another one. Actually, they made their national energy and climate plans um, a year ago. They have to redo it now. So this is a handle on how the European Commission can actually enforce that there is a little bit more biogas and biomethane than they did before, or not say a little bit, a lot more. Um, and we see that Poland is interested. And Spain is interested because they suddenly see biogas is not as small as, it, as we thought it was. Um, and we can actually provide jobs, local jobs. Um, so there is momentum. And within this, and I mentioned it before, the industrial partnership, we will bring in the member states as well, which is absolutely very necessary. And just to, to say one more thing, we, um, last year, a report of Angie came out. Um, it says around about 160 billion cubic meters in Europe for biomethane. There will be another report coming out soon, which, which will be, it is also for consultant, actually, but it, it's in the same region, and that is without e-methane. 160 billion cubic meters means 1,500, 1,600, 1,700 terawatt hours. We have a gas consumption within Europe of, uh, bear with me, a few numbers, 4,300 terawatt hours currently. 
European Commission wants to cut down by 30% in 2030, so we'll be close to 3,000 terawatt hours. If we can go up to our 160 billion cubic meters without e-methane, we are serving 50% of the gas, current gas supply, or gas demand there is. So we have a huge economic impact within Europe and given energy independent, because the hydrogen, a large part of that, will come from imports. Mm -hmm. Rest my case. Yeah, I mean, I would just add it, because interesting, I think, for example, if I were to take the oil super majors of all, all the big oil companies, you know, probably what the, the oil super major that has done less to pay real homage to the green cause is Total Energy. Uh, Total Energy are really hard-nosed about uh, uh, you, you know, their investments and about what they want to do. And Total Energy are now doing serious work on biogas. And that tells me that you know, potentially big organizations with a lot of administrative capacity, a lot of investment capacity, and ability to go to the financial markets are getting interested in this space. And it can, if, if we get it right, if we get the sequencing right, if we get the national delivery right, I think we can really motor very, very fast because this is a key inflection point for the industry. Um, and the key in getting projects really going quickly is ensuring that certainty. So investors have got to have certainty. At the moment, the price is high enough. I mean, if we thought this price was going to continue for 12 years or 15 years, you know, everybody and their dog would be investing in AD plants right the way across Europe right now. And so the only thing we haven't got is the certainty about how long it lasts. Now, I believe that given what was happening before the Ukraine crisis, there's no doubt, to my mind, we've had serious underinvestment in natural gas in all sorts of parts of the globe. And the price is going to stay high for those reasons. But that is not enough certainty. If you're going to go to a bank and actually raise the money to build an AD plant, you need to provide some certainty about the offtake. And the only other thing I would say is, you know, if it's not a policy issue, because that becomes policy, can we get anybody interested in the utilities to provide long-term offtakes? guaranteed offtakes, and at what sort of price. And you could see maybe there are European utilities now who would be prepared to sign contracts for biogas. It will be a lower than market price now, but the quid pro quo is that they give you a 12 or a 15 year old, 15 year fixed price, and that allows you to go to a, bank and, a banker and say, I can show you the revenue. Olivier told me what you're working on. Yeah, talk about it. yeah sure. Okay. So, um, Harman, you've been working on something that's very relevant to what Chris has just said. So do you want to outline that? Yeah, that, that is actually related to the industrial partnership. This is exactly what we are uh, working on. Um, so we are now bringing within Europe um, the companies together, um, the member states together. We are inviting parliament members and, of course, the EC all together to, to quickly, very quickly, um, with urgency, cut the red tape, making sure that we are harmonizing very quickly. It, it is hard, but I believe that here we can do something. Um, and that will probably start sometime in uh, October, where um, Vice President, Ex Executive Vice President already said um, he will be present and kick it off. Um, so that is, that is something very promising, I would say. It does sound very promising. Um, We've been having a great conversation here. You've all been listening. Does anybody have a question or comment? Uh, hi there, my name's Nick Adjuridis. I'm from Projective, um, and I'm a chemical engineer. So I've been listening to this with uh, fascination. Um, and um, I heard what, what Franz Timmerman said about the 3 billion cubic metres, pushing that up to 35. Um, and also the, the 160 figure you're talking about, uh, the first thing that comes into my head is resources. Uh, not monetary, but uh, people and technical competency and resources. Um, what are your thoughts about being able to do a tenfold increase in 
production capacity uh, by 2030. It sounds like a big ask to me. It's wonderful for people like me because, you know, we'll, we'll get to fill our boots, but um, it just strikes me as uh, uh, quite ambitious. Um, be interested to hear your thoughts about that. Shall I? Um, well, I think you're completely right that uh, we're going to need a lot of people moving into this sector. Uh, so it's one of the reasons that WBA has been working on developing a training platform um, that where anybody wanting to come and work in this sector can get access readily to good quality training to make sure that um, they get up to speed as fast as possible. Um, so um, that's, that's one thing we're doing. Um, uh, but yes, you're yeah. completely right. Harman, do you want to so, add? Yeah, I j just want to say, so um, the plan is to build 5,000 plants only by 2030. Um, Germany built 6,000 plants in uh, nine years' time. We need to do 5,000 mid-sized, be it mid-sized and industrial size plants. 4,000 mid-sized, 1,000 industrial. It is possible. Actually, they asked us for 60 billion cubic meters by 2030, and we said, no, no, we, we, we need to be careful. We would like to make the target, because I believe that our other renewables will not be able to make the target. We are going to make it. Um, but indeed, people, that is um, very important to get them in, train them. Um, and also, I was thinking, but to, to bring something else in, shouldn't we have a renewable ambassador from Europe going around the world talking about how Europe is doing that? Well, there are... Yeah, that, that would be that, that to be the icing on the cake, I think. I, I would say one other thing in terms of scaling up, um, and that is that as long as I've been involved in the AD industry, it's a, it is a sort of Savile Row industry. So, uh, you know, you want to make a, 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 an AD plant, you go to your Savile Row tailor and you get suited up and every bulge is carefully, you know, uh, fitted out. And this is costly. And the more AD we have and the quicker we want to go, the more we need a Marks and Spencer industry, not a Savile Row industry. So standardization, modular units that can be bolted on, things that can be, make the industry a lot easier. And standardization is actually something I think that Europe has actually been very good at historically uh, in other sectors. And so maybe that's something that we really need to do in this sector as well. The more standardized things are, the more we can get John Deere producing massive numbers of modular AD units which can just be churned out, then the easier it becomes. If we try and do this on a Savile Row bespoke suited basis with Italian cuffs and everything else, it's going to be more difficult. Um, so I completely agree with that. I'm sorry we are now uh, out of time for further questions, so apologies. Um, but I um, uh, completely agree with the point about standardization, what we're working on here from our members. But just to end, I think that was fabulously exciting to hear that level of commitment from the European Commission. I hope all of you are really prepared to step up to the plate and come in and help deliver it. And lastly, thank you very much to Harman Decker thank and you. Chris Hune for joining me and obviously to Franz uh, Timmermans. Thank you very much.